The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. please. I want to know, who's in charge here? You don't believe me? It's true. I do want to know who is in charge here. And you want to know, too. Has there ever been a more loaded question that any of us have either given voice to or wondered, who is in charge? So often that question comes up, maybe at work, huh? We want to know who's charge. You know, when things are going bad, we want to know who's in charge. It's funny how seldom we ask that question when things are going well. But it comes up a lot. It happens at work. It happens in our families. It happens here in church. We want to know who is responsible. And as Christians, we want to know who is responsible for the greater, grander scheme of things. And we profess again today on this Christ the King Sunday that ultimately, Jesus Christ is in charge. Just look at who occupies the throne of glory in today's gospel. Jesus himself, we hear, stands at the very end of history, both to welcome and to judge. I must say that from the time I was a little kid, even up through now, this text makes me shudder. Does it not create a little cringe in you too? All of us wonder, have I done my fair share? Have I done enough? Where did I miss out? Each of us stand convicted under the law by this gospel text, but also because of the gospel and because of the love and grace in Christ, we are also freed from those works which we feel we must have to do. 
And yet the challenge is always here. This is not a text that the gospel can dismiss simply because we live under grace. God calls us in grace and in love to be people of action, to be people who love and serve one another. And so more than any other text for me personally, this one always hits me right where it hurts and right where it counts. This is our work as the church. This is our mission. Now in Matthew's Gospel, the king asks, and again, I just talked about how, how frightening these words can be. He asks, what did you do? What did you, yes, each of us, what did you do when you saw anyone hungry or thirsty or in prison or in any kind of need? It's a tough question because we know how many times we have responded, times we've thought about responding, and times we've simply passed it off onto someone else. But you see, it's, it's precisely because of the difficulty of this question that it has a very nasty way of piercing right through all of the ways in which we deal with this challenge, all of our conversations and goals when it comes to Christian living. Jesus is not so much concerned, really, with what we say or what we think or all of our grand conversations. Jesus is totally concerned with what we do in serving our brother and sister in need, particularly, he says, the least of these. The paradox here is that those who do works of mercy without thought of reward will get their reward, Jesus says, but those who show mercy only to a select few, in a very calculated sense, he says, are just likely to find themselves excluded from God's kingdom. And as Matthew tells it further on in the story today, there's a very hard edge to this homecoming because we hear of distinction and separation along with these problems of punishment and reward. But that's not our problem. We can trust God every single time to do justice. Our problem is not justice. Our problem is together learning to look on the world to look on every challenge, on every single human being then, and to say we are all under God's power, not our own. And so the challenge for us is how do we proclaim that awesome truth? And how clearly then is that truth reflected in our personal allocations of our many, many resources? Again, that's what makes this text, I think, so hard and so challenging for each one of us because it peaks, speaks so personally to the call to love and serve. Let me put the question another way. Where does this power of God, the power of our King Jesus, where is that power present and then permeated in our consciousness? Where does it strengthen our resolve? Where does it settle our anxieties? Where does it clarify our vision? You see, this is a truth that is meant to stir us, not to pacify us, but to stir us, to compel us, to propel us into mission on behalf of the gospel so that we too can speak against injustice and exploitation and deception and all the ways that we allow ourselves as people, as nations, as humans, to be divided. It's up to God, Jesus says, to distinguish the sheep from the goats. But it certainly is up to us, then, to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbors, our fellow human beings, as ourselves. <coughs> D. Hawk, a former chief of Visa Bank Card, once made this statement, and, and I love it because it speaks so clearly, I think, to the challenge of being the church in mission today. She said, it's not that people today value money more, but that they value everything else so much less. Not that they're more greedy, necessarily, but that they have so few values to keep their greed in check. They don't know what else to value. 
Author Raymond Clark tells this fascinating story of a poor, hungry man who was walking down a street in an ancient village in medieval Turkey. And he had only the single piece of bread in his hand. That was it, all he had to eat. And as he's walking down the street, he eventually comes upon this restaurant owner who's grilling some meatballs out on an open grill right near the sidewalk. And the meat was so near, the smell was so delicious, and he got this idea, he thought, if I just hold my piece of bread over this grilling meat, it'll catch some of that wonderful smell. It'll taste so much better. And so quietly he does so. He's absorbed some of that wonderful, wonderful smell. But as he's doing that, the owner of the restaurant catches him. And he goes over and he sees him, and he immediately takes him to the judge. And he says, this man is guilty of stealing the smell of my meat without my permission. He was angry. I want you to make him pay me for that smell. Well, the judge just kind of smiled, sat back, thought about it a minute, and then he reached down in his pocket and got out a coin purse and shook it, dangled it in front of the restaurant owner. And the owner said, what in the world are you doing that for? And the judge replied, look, I am paying you. The sound of my money is fair payment for the smell of your food. <laughs> Pretty smart judge, huh? But then I got to thinking, is that all we have to offer those in need? The scent or the sound of our love and service? How prepared are we to offer the real thing? I know that you have tremendous capacity within each of you to love and to serve. I see it from you all the time. You are a caring, loving congregation that seeks to do God's work here and in the community and beyond. But alongside of that, every single one of us, within the sinful nature that we have, also has a capacity for self-centeredness. Just like everyone else, we desire more things, we desire more attention, more achievement, more pleasures, the list goes on. And sometimes we have to just pull back and say, enough already with all the desires. And that's why Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. Now, of course, that doesn't mean denying our God-given worth or importance, but it does mean to try and pull back, to deny that ongoing struggle we have, that craving for self-indulgence. Why? So that our desire, our goal, our hope of truly loving one another can find real expression. Now, you'll note that the determining measure that Jesus used here has to do with daily acts of love. The kinds of things that happen to us every single day. He's not asking us to do anything special, just to be on guard, to be open to the Spirit, to the people in our lives. Just go out, be yourself, but be these people of love and compassion where you are. Why? Because these are the tasks of the world. To think on a grander scheme of things here, if we are to come, Jesus says, before the judgment throne of God, and believe me, that will happen in your life and mine. It's not just some fantasy out there. Someday we will meet our Creator. It's there in the, it's there in the future, folks. Don't put it off. It'll come. And Jesus says, when that time does come, we had better come with the smell and the dirt of the world upon us. The world, Jesus says, is God's agenda. And it is our agenda as well. Looking back now, in 1872, George Westinghouse took out his first patent on an automatic air brake that would function far more quickly and safely than a manual handbrake that they used on the trains back then. But when Westinghouse came out with this idea, the railroad companies weren't quite sure. They were very suspicious. And when Westinghouse, here's the, uh, the best picture I could find of him, all right? When he wrote to Cornelius Vanderbilt, president of the New York Central, pointing out the advantages of his new invention, surprisingly, he got back this one sentence reply, I have no time to waste on fools. Ouch. 
Well, later, after a more visionary investor had put up the money for Westinghouse to further develop the invention, it suddenly took off. It went gangbusters. News began to spread. And Cornelius Vanderbilt, when he got news of it much later on, wrote back to Westinghouse, calling him this time a genius, issuing him an invitation to come and visit. Westinghouse, however, simply sent him a one-sentence reply, I have no time to waste on fools. <laughs> Only a fool would turn away from the life and purpose that God intends for each of us. Only a fool would squander energy and resources, all the precious things that are gifts to us, simply on self, while fellow human beings go without. On the day of judgment, Matthew says, there's a good chance such fools will receive a similar sentence from the creator of us all. Matthew implies that if we are to treat all people as we would treat Jesus, and as Jesus has treated us, then in every relationship, we either care for or neglect Jesus himself. And so today, we celebrate Christ as Lord and King of all. May his presence, may his teachings, his words, his promise, and the mission we share together, may all that come together and once again compel us to be compassionate, loving people in this world, ready for anything. Let us pray. Lord, on this Christ the King Sunday, we ask that you elevate our vision beyond today, that you elevate our scope of life beyond this moment. Lord, for a minute, help us to imagine the creation that you gave us from the very beginning, and now at the end of creation, at the time in which you gather all of us together, may we too imagine a great homecoming where we too will be welcomed among all your saints. Lord, help us to see much, much farther than what we are used to seeing, so that, Lord, when these challenges and invitations come, these hard challenges to give and to love and to serve, may we look ahead, Lord, to that day, as you have given us today, when all of us would be welcomed and brought together, and may our love and our acts of service always flow from your love for us. Bless us for our work together with one another. In Jesus' name, amen.